Owen Gingerich is a senior astronomer emeritus at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory and research professor of astronomy and of the history of science at Harvard University. He is the author of The Great Copernicus Chase and The Eye of Heaven. I interviewed him at Harvard. Okay, well, thanks for uh, taking the time out from your work to talk to me today. Um, you are uh, a scientist, and you're also, by your own account, religious. Um, and I gather that you, uh, first of all, see no contradiction between these two identities. But more than that, you see a kind of synergy between them. Uh, and by that, I mean, uh, on the one hand, in your scientific exploration of the universe, you find what, what you see as evidence of higher purpose or, or design in the universe. And on the other hand, I gather uh, that you, uh, you find that a belief in purpose and design, in a sense, facilitates your scientific work. And, and here I have in mind uh, uh, something that you, you wrote. Uh, At least for some of us, the universe is easier to comprehend if it has both purpose and design. Uh, what did you mean by that? Well, it seems to me that a universe that just is, and we happen to be here as part of this incredible, astonishing complexity uh, without any sort of purpose or ultimate meaning, makes it sort of a macabre joke. And I find it difficult to uh, accept that. I suppose this is a, a gut reaction of how things ought to be, and It is one of those things that I can't prove, but it simply makes a lot more sense to me uh, to think that somehow there is ultimate purpose and reason behind it. So you would literally have more trouble trying to figure out the way the physical world works if you thought that there was no point to the physical world. I think this has been a driving force throughout the whole history of science, a belief in a kind of unity and a kind of uh, design that is possible for human beings as uh, creatures connected with God, created in the image of God, it has kept scientists going in this remarkable pursuit to understand. Yeah, well, it's certainly true that all scientists come to think of it, whether they're religious or not, are assuming in some sense a unity. That's the, the driving assumption always is that you can boil down the data to more unified form, and that's what everyone's after. Are, are, uh, I think Einstein said that the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is its comprehensibility. The fact that we can hope to understand it is truly remarkable, and it seems to me that that's part of the pattern, that somehow we're endowed with the ability to understand it because there is something about it that is fundamentally understandable. The, now, the, the synergy between the religious and the scientific side of you also works in the, in the other direction. It, it isn't just that religion facilitates your science, but in, in your science you, 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 you find what you see as evidence to, to, that affirms your religious belief. What's an example of that? It seems to me that there's always a creative tension between the religious ideas and ideals and what you see in the natural world, which in many respects seems surprisingly cruel and heartless. So uh, how you play these two things together is uh, something that is part of a pilgrimage of understanding where you try to put that together. Now, in looking, for example, at the way the elements are made, there is something remarkable in the early part of the periodic table. You have hydrogen, the simplest atom. Uh, it has an atomic weight of one, more or less by definition. And then you get deuterium, a weight of two, and tritium, a weight of three, helium, four, But there's no stable mass five. And this has truly remarkable consequences for the universe as we see it. Uh, it was sometimes referred to by the late Willie Fowler, Nobel laureate in physics, as God's goof. 
that there was no mass five. So if you look at a periodic table, there's a blank square there in the top row, is that it? There's no blank square. It's because the atomic table of elements uh, goes according to the charges in the nucleus. And you get one, two, three, four, five in terms of charges, but not in terms of mass. And if you're going to make the elements from scratch or from a big bang, you're going to do it by joining hydrogen atoms together. Weight one, one plus one is two, mm -hmm. plus one is three, plus four, you get helium, but plus five, it doesn't stick and it falls apart again. Uh. And that prevents you from building up to the higher elements in that three minutes of the cooking of the elements in the Big Bang. And then what was the long-term implication of that inability? In order to get beyond this, you have to build them up by putting helium atoms together, which is weight four, and it goes four at a time. Three times four is 12, and that's carbon, and that's what is basic to the chemistry of you and me. Add another helium, and you get to oxygen. Carbon and oxygen are, after hydrogen and helium, the two most abundant elements in the universe, and they're absolutely essential for life. If there were a mass five, you would then be able to build it up one step at a time and go zooming right up towards the heavier elements in the moments of the Big Bang, and the abundances would be entirely different from what we see now. So what might in some peculiar sense be seen as a goof turns out to be absolutely essential for making the abundances that are exactly what we need for higher organisms and for intelligent life. So would we have never gotten carbon at all? We would have gotten carbon, but not in the present abundance. It would be an also ran probably. Uh-huh. And, well, I mean, I guess there's no way of knowing whether what we would have gotten instead would have been conducive to life, right? Or, of course, I mean, part of the, the, uh, part of the, the premise of all of this is that carbon is the basic building block of life as we know it, right? I think if you look at the properties of the uh, more abundant atoms, uh, carbon plays an utterly unique role. It's very difficult for us to imagine how you could get a comparable complexity using some other atom. But of course, it isn't necessary to worry about that because carbon turns out to be so ubiquitously abundant. And therefore, it's always available for exactly this purpose of making a complex organic chemistry. The reason carbon is so special is that it can bond with itself into long chains, into rings, in very complex forms. And that is the basis for the entire system of uh, enzymes, uh, those chemicals that uh, do all the machinery inside of our cells. Uh, it simply is the complexity that makes our life possible. Mm -hmm. Now this is, uh, this is sometimes referred to as the anthropic principle, the, 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 the idea that in, in various ways, the, the various fundamental constants and so on of the universe uh, happen to be exactly or, or close to exactly what you would need uh, to get life. Uh, and there, there's a number of these things, the gravitational constant and so on. Uh, I gather. That's what this, this is one, the, the, the example you just gave is an example of the anthropic principle, right? I have given an example of the anthropic principle, and Sir Martin Rees, the astronomer royal, has a recent book entitled uh, Just Six Numbers, and these are essentially six anthropic numbers. They are dimensionless numbers that, if they were changed by a relatively small amount, any one of them, would make life impossible. And yet, they all seem to be independent of each other, and there they are. If you want to think a little bit more about the anthropic principle, by the way, it's had an interesting history. Uh, when it was proposed as an idea, uh, it was essentially saying, look, 
all these things are so magnificently tuned, it looks as if the universe was specifically designed to make life possible. Later on, the uh, people who were uncomfortable with that uh, turned the argument upside down, essentially saying, but look, if it wouldn't be like that, we wouldn't be here to speculate. And therefore, it is necessary that we find a universe with all these anthropic numbers in them simply because we're here. Right, so in their view, it's almost redundant to say the universe is conducive to life. After all, we're, we're here. I mean, the life is here, so, so you're almost adding no information. That's their argument, right? That's the argument. And it seems to me that there are sort of three ways you can approach this. Uh, you can say, uh, well, somehow there is a master plan and the universe has been designed uh, so that it's possible for us to be here. Or secondly, that somehow the way universes work, we just are in one of myriad universes. That these multi-universes come with all kinds of uh, physical principles, dimensions, constants, and that then out of this huge number, we are necessarily in the one that happens to have this configuration. Now thirdly, you could suppose that there is something physical about the universe that it could be no other way, that there are no alternative universes possible, that the constants for reasons we don't understand have to be this way in order to make a universe at all. Now, some people might say, okay, those last two of the three options are the scientific ones. The first option is essentially a religious option because you're saying that there is something supernatural out there that accounts for the design. But it seems to me that if you, the more you think about it, the more blurred this all becomes. Because if the universe has to be this way and can be no other, uh, does that preclude a design or a designer? seems to me that it's uh, much the same. It's once more just turning the same kind of information on its head and approaching it from another direction. So essentially, I would have to say, if I was speaking to a mixed audience of skeptics and theists, uh, that all of you are men of faith. Even those of you who are skeptics have opted for a belief system that you happen to have chosen that rules out the notion of God, but that's something that you cannot prove in any way. It may make more sense to you that way, and uh, I... I would have trouble uh, arguing against them. I know, for example, that Steve Weinberg, an eminent uh, physicist, uh, one of the very uh, creative scientists of our generation, uh, is rejecting the notion of God, and it has nothing to do with the way in which the physical constants are put together in the universe. It has nothing to do with nuclear physics or atomic structure. It has to do with the problem of evil. He finds it difficult to conceive of a beneficent creator in a world that has so much suffering in it. And an omnipotent one, one that was both benign and omnipotent. You yes, of course. You could have done better. And, wh and why is that not a problem for you? I suppose it's a way of, of weighing things. And I see this as a tremendous problem, but I feel that's in somebody else's ball court. You know, you start thinking about these problems, the scientific ones, the cosmological ones, the theological ones, and there's no way you're going to solve all of them. You can't be uh, the polymath, the Renaissance person who uh, combines 
uh, Aristotle and Aquinas and Leonardo and all the rest in one brain and solves all the problems. So you're going to leave the problem of evil to theologians then? Exactly. <laughs> you have to leave that's, some that's things aside. That's the best aside. solution to it I've heard yet. Uh, the, now, the one group of people you can't accuse of making a leap of faith, I would think, is agnostics, right? Atheists are, in a sense, assuming something they can't prove. But that's not true of agnostics, right? If you're agnostic and say you simply don't know, and you're open to arguments from both sides, uh, I suppose it's more difficult to uh, pin a tag of faith on on these people. I wonder how many uh, honest agnostics one has. It was interesting in a debate between Steve Weinberg and John Polkinghorne that Steve Weinberg said, most people aren't entitled to be atheists because they haven't thought about it enough. So I suppose you do have a, a large, unthinking uh, middle ground of people who, who quite honestly, uh, haven't made any kind of leap of faith on this matter because they uh, just haven't thought about it enough even to try to decide. One, one thing I, I've been wondering lately is what... What happened before the Big Bang? The reason I say that is I had always assumed that that was a question that was by definition not amenable to scientific analysis, what happened before the Big Bang. But then I saw a newspaper article not long ago about these various, I guess, scientific theories about what happened before the Big Bang. Is that or is that not something that, that scientists can, can, can investigate? It's interesting that if you look at theology and you would talk, let's say, uh, to Pannenberg, uh, he would talk about eternity as something very different from the passage of time, that eternity somehow embodies all of time within it. And I suppose the scientists are coming around to think about eternity in a sense that if you want to ask what happened before the Big Bang, you're going outside of our ordinary measure of time because time, in an Einsteinian sense, uh, is present only when you have change and motion. And you don't have change and motion uh, as long as uh, you have nothing. Which that is, is the case say, before the Big Bang? That's By right. Definition. But you could nevertheless define an eternity as something in which time is embedded. And if you have this kind of eternity, there might arise other universes and even the possibility of universes that either lack a dimension of time, have multiple dimensions of time, or so on. It's very hard to wrap ourselves around anything like that because we are, as creatures, extraordinarily time-dependent. Yeah. We, we think in terms of cause and effect. Uh, we uh, think of ourselves as having a past that can be remembered and a future which is inaccessible to us. Uh, these... Uh, these questions about the nature of time are, are very interesting and profound. And I think when people ask what happened before the Big Bang, they are, for the most part, not divorcing themselves from the notion of time. They're thinking of before in a sense of, you know, what's happening out there. And it's not what's happening because that it, what's happening is a time-dependent notion. So is it, does this fact that, uh, that to step past beyond the Big Bang, to go back before the Big Bang, is to leave a time-dependent universe? I would say so. D does, that, does that mean that it really is not a subject for scientific investigation, properly speaking, and is just a matter for philosophical and theological speculation? Or... Are there scientists who, who hope to, can realistically hope to find some data at some point that would support one scenario or another? It's very curious because I have an ongoing discussion uh, with Martin Rees about this, 
And I know a lot of other cosmologists would tell him that, hey, this is just a metaphysical speculation that there are multiverses out there. Uh, And he says, no, no, the mathematics shows that in this kind of model, there's no reason why you can't change the parameters and have uh, other quite different universes. And if you can show mathematically that they can be there, uh, there's nothing to prevent them from actually being there. I think many people have a problem with that because it is hopeless to get in touch with any of these other universes. But I always have to pause and say, for a long time, Christians have been talking about a totally other universe uh, that we don't have direct access to, uh, and that's heaven, the hereafter, paradise, whatever. Uh, It's curious. I think most scientists would, uh, even if they believe in multiverses, uh, feel somewhat uneasy at the notion that, hey, wait a minute, theologians have already been there. Hmm. I don't know how closely related this is, but somewhere in your writing you brought up this book, Flatland, this well-known book. Uh, Can you, first of all, describe, summarize the the plot, kind of, uh, and then say a little about its relevance to the intersection of science and religion? Flatland is an extraordinarily interesting book about... Uh, life in a two-dimensional world, uh, which is then uh, interrupted by the presence of a visitor from a three-dimensional world, a sphere who manifests himself as a circle that can grow larger and larger and then smaller and smaller again as the sphere passes through this one-dimensional plane. The uh, creature in this three, in this two-dimensional uh, flatland world who begins to get the vision of a third dimension is locked up as crazy. Uh, but uh, the sphere, on the other hand, is greatly insulted at the thought that there might be four dimensions, uh, one lying beyond him. And the whole idea of the book is to get people into the notion of thinking of higher dimensions and how they could interact with our three-dimensional world. This then in turn becomes very popular because uh, so much of general relativity uh, can be explained in terms of multi-dimensions. And nowadays, uh, with the so-called string theory, which may or may not turn out to be a great explanatory device for multiple universes and all of this, uh, is now talking, again, in terms of multiple dimensions. Here's something you wrote uh, in a uh, uh, a book of collected essays called How Large is God? Um, You wrote, as we become more sophisticated in constructing our view of the cosmos, We must likewise become more nuanced in our view of God, of the divine. It makes no sense to drive an ox cart down the interstate. What did you mean by that? Well, clearly, a lot of uh, biblical imagery is set in a different cosmological time of a much smaller, closed kind of a world. And I think we have to uh, come to terms with the vastness of the universe And we have to understand that just because the universe is so vast, it doesn't mean that we're insignificant because we're so small. We have to understand that these vast reaches of time and space are closely coupled with the way in which the elements have come to be. And it seems to have taken a very, very long time uh, to get the iron built up in the slow cooking of stellar interiors, those fiery furnaces that have produced the elements required for our bodies, for our blood, for uh, so many of the uh, more esoteric biochemical reactions inside us. So uh, when when I look at many of the 
uh, scriptural discussions, I have to say, hmm, well, I'm a little uneasy at this. Uh, the idea of the ascension of Jesus into heaven, uh, I mean, does he go up and is picked up by an alien spacecraft? Uh, where is up with respect to uh, our universe? It made every bit of sense for a kind of medieval universe where uh, the heavenly hosts were assembled just beyond the sphere of Jupiter. It makes no sense at all to us now. That's what I mean by driving an ox cart down the uh, superhighway. You have abandoned some of the traditional details of Christian belief, uh, at least in their specifics. Um, and I've actually found another quote of yours in which uh, you can, you, it seems to me you have a, the way you describe God is in a, a vaguer way than Christians would have thought of God 150 years ago, say. Uh, you say, for me, it makes sense to suppose that the superintelligence, the transcendence, the ground of being in Paul Tillich's formulation has revealed itself through prophets in all ages and supremely in the life of Jesus Christ. Now, these terms of the transcendence, the ground of being, the superintelligence, this is, doesn't sound like, you know, a, a guy with a beard in a throne that you might have thought of some people think of today, but you, 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 you know, more Christians might have thought of uh, in an earlier time. So, so, can you talk a little about the way you're? I mean, what is what is God in your? In I your think view? that many people have a view of God that is very much fixed by the Sistine Chapel, with the old man reaching his finger out and creating Adam. Uh, that's a view that goes back very far, but that imagery is so profound in our understanding and thinking about God. And yet, when you think about this uh, creator of all of the natural world, the incredible power, the incredible knowledge, understanding, and omnipotence of something like that, is so far beyond human comprehension that uh, this is hardly something that we can even begin to relate to. Uh, it becomes very much a danger with natural theology to generate an image of God of large numbers, of incredible uh, feats and power and so on. If God has this omnipotence and wants to relate to his creatures, then I would say that uh, God would also have the power to come forward in many different aspects, including uh, the aspect of this uh, uh, patriarchal figure uh, that appears in the Leonardo uh, Sistine Chapel. But I think as we begin to understand more and more about God, we understand that that really is not a satisfactory view because that is so much a projection of a particular kind of patriarchal society on what God should be like. And it is quite possible that God in the revealed aspects, uh, in fact, uh, changes and adapts to an interaction with humankind. So how can information come to humankind? I am not myself a believer that you find it hewn on tablets of stone or uh, uh, coming to you uh, on a microchip or however else might be possible for revelation. Revelation has to come through uh, the minds of humankind. And it would come uh, through people who have religious experiences, who think very deeply with deep understanding. And this kind of revelation can come very clearly through a person in the case, let us say, 
of Jesus. But I would think that it is uh, a very bold kind of arrogance to suppose that that's the only way that God has come and revealed itself to us. So I would say I would not dismiss the notion of a personal God, but I would have to say that the personal God is only a tiny fraction of what God is all about. And that is the fraction that, that gives us the possibility of, of a relationship. So that I'm afraid that uh, natural theology doesn't really uh, build up a great picture of, uh, of the God that we would worship and find uh, useful in making ethical decisions or relating to our fellow human beings. As you describe God in, in kind of more abstract terms than maybe Christians would have done uh, in the 19th century, um, are you increasingly describing God in a way uh, that could apply to other religions aside from Christianity? I mean, I mean, are, are we moving toward con- some conception of God that transcends the individual great religions and, and encompasses them all, something that Hindus could agree on and so on? Or, or I think that very many of us, and the us includes the people who are looking at this particular video, uh, uh, grew up in an environment where you thought that heaven was a pretty small place, that we pretty well knew who was going to be there, and there were an awful lot of people out there who weren't. Uh, and I think as one matures and begins to understand uh, the human aspirations about God, uh, one realizes that uh, we... Uh, have not the power to uh, limit the reach of of God's uh, attention to his creatures. So I guess I would have to tell you that uh, I would be much more open to other paths to God uh, than I once would have understood uh, growing up in a small rural community in Iowa. But at the same time, as your as your conception of God becomes uh, more, I guess you might say, ecumenical in the broadest sense, in a global sense, in other words, possibly moving beyond Christianity, uh, you still say that you think God has been revealed supremely in the life of Jesus Christ, which I take to mean more fully than in the life of any other prophet. That I would, I would subscribe to that, yes. And uh, I find that there is a, uh, a very compelling story in the life of Jesus and uh, the teachings of forgiveness, of salvation, and I begin to think that there are unexpected treasures in this message when we're locked up on the planet Earth and realize that we're running out of things that unless we can learn about sharing and forgiveness, uh, we're, we're in some problem for the future of the human race. But what about people who would say that although those are important lessons and maybe more important than ever, that, that uh, they are incarnate in the Buddha in as full and admirable a sense as in Jesus? There may be people who have studied that tradition and who are within that tradition, uh, who find that very fulfilling. I suspect there are many, many people uh, in the Buddhist movement who are simply weighed down by an enormous burden of superstition. And I would have to say that the same thing could be said for aspects of Christianity. I was about to suggest that myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, in general, religions have, have... shown a tendency to move away from lots of particular superstitions, uh, would, wouldn't you say, uh, as, as society has evolved toward modernization? Yes, of course. Okay. There's one c- 
kind of religious worldview that some people see as being the most compatible with a modern scientific worldview, which I think you frown on, which is pan pantheism. Is that... Uh, and first of all, can you tell us what the word means in your understanding? Uh, pantheism means that uh, you would find God everywhere, that in some sense the universe itself is God. Right. Uh, and I think that's a kind of a view of... Uh, that Einstein held a certain kind of awe about the structure, the marvelous way in which the universe hangs together and is understandable. Uh, and he had a certain reverence uh, as he looked at the world as a result of that. It was a kind of religious understanding that really had no place for what you would call a personal God. Mm -hmm. And I would say that in that sense, I would not find pantheism particularly satisfying. And have you heard the word panentheism? I have heard the word panentheism, and I have never been able to get a firm grasp on it. Not well enough to discuss it intelligently. I gather it means that the universe is inside of God, like inside of God's mind or something. But in that case, I'm not sure I clearly get the distinction between that and Lots of other things, lots of other religious scenarios. This is my problem. Yeah. Okay. Well, enough about that. Well, uh, closing, let me just ask, you, you, uh, you see evidence of design and purpose in the universe. What, what would you say the purpose is? Not that, again, that this is a scientific conclusion on your part, I think, but, w but w what, in your view, is the purpose of the whole physical enterprise that we see before us? As... Uh, thinking conscious human beings, we have to suppose that we play an important part in this purpose of the universe. Otherwise, we can't philosophically understand it except in those terms. And then we would perhaps conclude that the purpose is to study and understand the universe that God has prepared a universe in which this kind of consciousness could arise, and therefore, within that framework, uh, it is uh, to examine the universe, to understand it, and at the same time, of course, uh, to use that understanding uh, to enhance the relationships between uh, the creatures on the earth. So science is central to the whole purpose of the universe as you, as you see it. This is a very Keplerian notion. Johannes Kepler felt that uh, by studying the universe, he was glorifying God. And I suppose that is, uh, for a scientist, a kind of parochial view, but one that I find very congenial. Okay. Well, thank you. I gather you're off to Africa soon to see your, what, 12th, 13th, or 14th uh, personally witnessed solar eclipse? Uh, yes. It depends whether you count being under the shadow or whether you were, had actually a clear view of the sky. So I think I'm uh -huh. going to 11 or 12 of the latter. I'm not counting the eclipse on our honeymoon when it was cloudy. Oh, I see. Well, you're, you're ahead of me regardless of what your criteria are, so uh, enjoy it. Thanks a lot. Okay, good enough.